Welcome to this edition of News Today. Without delay, let's explore today's main headlines. Ministry of Education issues guidelines for registration and regulation of Coaching Centre 2024. Pension Fund Regulatory and Development Authority notifies new point of presence regulations for NPS subscribers. Ministry of New and Renewable Energy notifies incentive schemes for production of green ammonia and green hydrogen. Government approves fund for revamped scheme for administrative reforms of the Department of Administrative Reforms and Public Grievances. World Economic Forum's AI Governance Alliance calls for global efforts for inclusive access to advanced artificial intelligence. Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development releases a report titled Breaking the Vicious Circles of Informal Employment and Low-Paying Work. Starting with today's first news, the Ministry of Education has issued guidelines for registration and regulation of Coaching Centre 2024. These guidelines were forwarded to the states and union territories for consideration, recognizing that education falls under the concurrent list and coaching institutes are in the jurisdiction and regulated by the states and union territories. Now let's take a look at some major points of the newly released guidelines. State and union territories were urged to develop an online registration portal for coaching centers. Coaching centers have to be registered within three months from the date of implementation of these guidelines. According to the guidelines, no coaching center shall be allowed to engage tutors having qualification below graduation or make misleading promises or guarantee of rank or good marks to parents or students for enrolling them. Also, a coaching center shall have a website with updated details of the qualification of their tutors. Now the question is, what was the need for such regulations? Recent cases of loss of lives due to reasons such as fire and suicide cases in coaching centers, as well as their methodology and charging of exorbitant fee from students have led to calls to regulate them. Effective oversight is also needed to take action against misleading ads by coaching centers and institutions under the Consumer Protection Act of 1986. Further, there is a need to provide proper career guidance and psychological counselling for the mental well-being of the students. Importantly, the National Education Policy of 2020 focuses on a regular formative assessment for learning rather than the summative assessment that encourages the prevalent coaching culture. Moving on, the Pension Fund Regulatory and Development Authority has notified new points of presence regulations for NPS subscribers. First, let's take a closer look at the National Pension System or NPS. The system was introduced by the central government in 2004 to help individuals have income in the form of a pension. Any citizen of India, whether resident or NRI, can join NPS. NPS is mandatory to all employees joining services of the central government as well as central autonomous bodies on or after 1st January 2004. This mandate does not apply to the armed forces. Pension Fund Regulatory and Development Authority or PFRDA regulates NPS under the PFRDA Act of 2013. Talking about PFRDA, it is a statutory body under the Ministry of Finance established under the PFRDA Act of 2013. Its objective is to promote old age income security by establishing, developing and regulating pension funds. Coming back to the news, PFRDA has notified the point of presence regulations 2023 requiring only one registration for the national pension system. Points of presence are the first points of interaction of the NPS subscriber with the NPS architecture. The authorized branches of a point of presence called point of presence service providers will act as collection points. Banks and non-banks can now act as point of presence to onboard NPS subscribers and they will require only a single registration for NPS instead of multiple registrations earlier. The timeline for disposing of applications has also been reduced from 60 days to 30 days. The simplification is in line with the Union Budget 2023-24 announcement to review regulations to reduce the cost of compliance and enhance the ease of doing business. 
In the next news, Ministry of New and Renewable Energy has notified incentive schemes for production of green ammonia and green hydrogen. First, let's understand more about green hydrogen and ammonia. Green hydrogen is the hydrogen produced by splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen using renewable energy. Green ammonia is ammonia produced using renewable energy sources. Traditionally, ammonia is produced through the Haber-Bosch process. Both green hydrogen and ammonia are considered important as they can help in reducing emissions in the hard to abate sectors and lower dependence on fossil fuels. Further, they have multiple use cases including electricity, industrial or mobility and contribute to improving a nation's energy security. Coming back to the news, recent schemes have been notified under Mode 2A for Green Ammonia and Mode 2B for Green Hydrogen of Component 2 of Strategic Interventions for Green Hydrogen Transition or SITE program under the National Green Hydrogen Mission. The schemes aim to maximize production, enhance cost competitiveness and encourage large-scale utilization of green ammonia and green hydrogen. The implementing agency for Mode 2A scheme is the Solar Energy Corporation of India Limited under Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. And for Mode 2B scheme, it is the Oil and Gas Companies and Centre for High Technology nominated by Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas. Now before moving on, let's take a look at the National Green Hydrogen Mission. Launched for the period ranging from financial year 2024 to financial year 2030, the objective of the mission is to make India a global hub for producing, utilizing and exporting green hydrogen. The mission's subcomponents are site program, pilot projects, R&D program and skill development. Under the site program, there are two distinct financial incentive mechanisms. Component 1 targets domestic manufacturing of electrolyzers and component 2 is for production of green hydrogen. Coming to the next news, the government has approved the Fund for Revamped Scheme for Administrative Reforms of Department of Administrative Reforms and Public Grievances or the DARPG. The scheme will be implemented in the next two years of the 15th Finance Commission cycle. The revamped scheme for administrative reforms has two verticals. Let's go through the first vertical, the scheme for the comprehensive system for redressal of public grievances. The various components are quality redressal, that is taking forward the 10-step CP grants reforms or the centralized public grievance redress and monitoring system reforms, which are aimed at improving quality of grievance redressal. AI-assisted redressal, that is reducing timelines by developing AI-assisted public grievance redressal system or CP grams. Unified grievance redressal, this project will integrate all other grievance portals, thus making the CP grams single largest interface for public grievances. Lastly, capacity building, which will ensure deeper technology adoption and capacity building of grievance redressal officers. The second vertical is the scheme for administrative reforms. This scheme seeks to utilize resources for international exchange and cooperation activities, like National E-Governance Award Scheme. The significance of the scheme lies in the fact that it will ensure seamless service delivery to citizens, efficient decision-making, strengthening accountability and transparency with timely grievance redressal. Coming to the Centralized Public Grievance Redress and Monitoring System or CPGRAMS. It is an online platform available to citizens 24-7 to lodge their grievances to the public authorities on any subject related to service delivery. Issues which are not taken up by the CP grams include RTA matters and court related issues. Coming to the next news, the World Economic Forum's AI Governance Alliance has called for global efforts for inclusive access to advanced artificial intelligence. The alliance launched in 2023 aims to accelerate the development of ethical guidelines and governance frameworks for generative AI. Generative AI is a type of AI technology that can produce various types of content, including text, imagery, audio and synthetic data. And World Economic Forum or WEF is an international non-profit organization based in Geneva committed to improving the state of the world. At the recent WEF annual meeting 2024, the Alliance released new reports on advanced AI focusing on generative AI governance. 
Let's go through the key highlights. The absence of a standardized perspective on the generative AI model life cycle, vague definitions etc. are impacting the development of safe generative AI. The global landscape for AI governance is complex and rapidly evolving and the alliance recommended for international coordination, a multi-stakeholder approach involving government, civil society, academia and industry for legitimate governance of AI. Compatible standards. To avoid significant differences in standards, national bodies should work together and align their efforts. Flexible regulatory mechanisms. To match AI's rapid advancements, investment in innovation and governance frameworks must be agile and adaptable. To include Global South at all AI stages for innovation, ensuring everyone benefits and minimizing global harms. Let's take a look at the different approaches for AI governance. Risk-based, which focuses on classifying and prioritizing risks in relation to the potential harm of AI. Rules-based, which lays out detailed and specific rules. Principles-based, which sets out fundamental principles or guidelines for AI systems. Lastly, outcomes-based, which focuses on achieving measurable AI-related outcomes without defining specific processes that must be followed for compliance. Coming to the next news, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development or the OECD has released a report titled Breaking the Vicious Circles of Informal Employment and Low Paying Work. The report investigates persistence of informal employment and challenges in breaking free from informal employment. Now what is informal employment? Well, informal employment is defined as all remunerative work that is not registered, regulated or protected by existing legal framework as well as non-remunerative work undertaken in income producing enterprises. Let's go through the observations of the report. Informal workers make up nearly 60% of the workforce globally and 90% in low income countries. Vulnerability of informal workers is passed on to the children in the absence of adequate education, skills and social protection policy. Larger share of workers in developing and emerging economies carry the double burden of informality and low paying work. Coming to a few India specific observations. Low wage informalization which means strong segmentation of labor market with high persistence of both formal wage employment and low income informal wage employment. Social segmentation which can be explained as the strong gender and caste based segmentation in which women, lower caste workers, workers with less formal education and rural workers are less likely to formalize. Let's go through the policy recommendations. Alleviating double burden is the first recommendation through remuneration policies that address inequality, effective minimum wages and improve bargaining power of low paid informal workers. Lastly, increasing formalization. Increasing formalization is the second recommendation that is ensuring adequate coverage by labor laws, social security and tax regulations. The personality in the news for today is Surya Sen. He was remembered on his death anniversary. Surya Sen was popularly known as Master Da and born in the Chittagong neighborhood of Nuapada, which is now in Bangladesh. Let's briefly go through his contributions. He participated in the non-cooperation movement. He is known for remarking that humanism is a distinctive virtue of a revolutionary. Under his leadership, an armed force named Indian Republican Army was established in 1930. He was joined by Kalpana Dutt, and Prithilata Wadidar. He commanded 1930 Chittagong Armory Raid and he exhibited the values of courage and selflessness. As we conclude today's main news, let's take a look at some quick updates. Ministry of Finance invites suggestions on draft Indian Stamp Bill 2023 from public. Once enacted, the bill shall replace Indian Stamp Act of 1899 which deals with law relating to tax levied in the form of stamps on instruments recording transactions. The board has mandated all tea producers to limit generation of tea waste not exceeding 0.2% of production for quality produce. Tea Board India is a statutory body set up under the Tea Act of 1953. It functions under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. Future of Growth Report 2024 was recently released by the World Economic Forum. 
The report assesses the quality of economic growth across 107 countries in four dimensions – innovativeness, inclusiveness, sustainability and resilience. According to it, India along with Kenya have scored high on sustainability. Indian Institute of Wheat and Barley Research in Karnal, Haryana has appealed to the farmers to remain vigilant against yellow rust. Stripe rust or yellow rust of wheat is caused by a fungal pathogen and appears in the form of yellow stripes on wheat leaves. Panama Canal has been hit by a severe drought forcing authorities to slash ship crossings by 36%. The canal is one of the two most strategic artificial waterways in the world, the other being the Suez Canal. It connects the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans and links North America with South America. Demand has been raised to revive Willingdon Island, which took on a deserted appearance following the relocation of container terminal operations to Vallar Padam in Kerala. The island is one of the largest man-made islands in the country located near Kochi. It was created in 1933 and named after the then British Viceroy of India, Lord Willingdon. ISRO has developed a second-generation distress alert transmitter incorporating advanced satellite communication and navigation capabilities. Distress alert transmitter is an indigenous technological solution for the fishermen at sea to send emergency messages from fishing boats. A Chinese startup claims to develop a nuclear battery capable of producing power for 50 years without charging. Such batteries use energy from the decay of radioactive isotope to generate electricity. Unlike nuclear reactors, they do not rely upon nuclear fission for power generation. Before we go, it's time to put your knowledge to the test in today's segment of Test Your Learning. Thank you for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed this edition of News Today. To get the answers to today's quiz and to download the PDF of News Today, make sure to check out the links in the description below.